Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. And in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about pursuit and evasion in hex crawls. So this is one of those areas of the game that I think a lot of people kind of gloss over. People love hex crawls. If you look around, there's a lot of videos about hex crawls, including some on this channel. And sometimes people think, oh, we're going to run away in the dungeon. But because of the nature of a hex crawl with distances and stuff, I think that when the party in, interacts with the creature that's far away, a lot of times we just role play it and that's fine. But there are procedures to this and this can be very useful for us if we want to just kind of make a ruling or obviously we can just use the rules. So I'm going to go over what's here in the expert book, some ideas of how I would use it and have used it. And I'll even give some examples that way you can see how it'd work out. Okay, so here we're looking at the expert book. Again, this is basic expert, which has essentially been re organized into OSC. So if you're using OSC, that's the same information is just displayed differently. I like to use my original books. You can pick this up on draft through RPG. There's links in the description. It talks about surprise and initiative and the turn order. Remember that when you're traveling in a hex crawl, it almost becomes this like zoom out, right? Each turn, if it if you think of it that way, is one day. You're kind of figuring out what happens that day so that you can create this story that goes on multiple days pretty quickly. It zooms in when you hit an encounter and then we switch to rounds. So if there is surprise, so if there's a potential for surprise, then that can happen. And if some, if the party is surprised, if either party is surprised, they cannot evade. So you can think of it like the idea of you're going through the woods, you've got the bard singing or whatever, you're making a lot of noise, and there's some goblins hidden nearby hunting, and they hear you, they have a chance to surprise you, but not the other way around. Same is true if there's like a large war band of orcs traveling and you have a small party and you've been talking about traveling quietly. I always ask my players, how are you traveling? Are you trying to be quiet? Are you making a lot of noise? Are you, you know, and, and they'll let me know. And then usually it depends on how dangerous they think the area is. Because sometimes I'll say, well, if you want to go, you know, go tree to tree and be very quiet, it's going to slow you down. This gives the players a choice and player choices are what drives the game forward in my mind. So let's take a quick look here. We're, we have the same monster reactions. So you encounter a group of bugbears in the woods, you roll on this table, you might get immediate attack, you might get hostile possible attack, uncertain, no attack, etc., etc. This is all the same as in the dungeon, so nothing's really changing here, but this does factor into the idea that not everything's going to fight you. But let's get into the actual evasion rules. I'm going to read it, it's not very long, and then we will uh, kind of walk through how it works, because it's a little unclear, especially this table is a little unclear. The table in OSE is definitely better. Evasion. In the wilderness, parties with surprise may always avoid an encounter if desired. Okay, so if the party surprises that group of bugbears, they can just duck behind the bushes, let them go by, they've evaded them, done. If the party does not surprise and still seeks to avoid an encounter, the evasion table is used. Compare the size of the party to the number of creatures encountered. This gives a percentage chance the evasion will be successful. If a large party breaks up into smaller parties, roll for each small party separately. There's always at least a 5% chance to evade, unless you're surprised. Okay, so what this means is you've got a group of a war band, let's say of 100 orcs, they're not, you'll see on the chart following, they're not going to have a very good chance of catching the party or the party's going to have a very good chance of evading them, right? But if they break, if they now send out scouts in groups of four or five, they're going to have a better chance of finding the party. This works logically if you think about it. I know that a lot of people see this immediately and go, well, wouldn't a bigger group have a better chance of catching? Well, only if they break up into smaller groups. When you're talking about the larger group, you're considering they're all one mass moving. So let's take a quick look at this chart and see how it works. So we're going to look at the number of creatures versus the party size. Now, I know that a lot of more modern games, the party size is usually four, right? Or maybe five. So you'd think, wow, 25 plus, plus, that sounds really crazy. But think about it. This is for hex crawling. So you're talking about not only the group, which tends to be a little bit larger in an old school game, but also their henchmen and possibly retainers, people to handle the horses. You're going to have a large group traveling through the wilderness. In my OD&D game, I'm currently running the party is actually only three players and they have five NPCs with them. <laughs> so their group is eight. So you can see that this is pretty easy to, to get to these larger numbers. But let's take a look. Let's say that we've got a group of four adventurers. Each one has a henchman. So we'll say it's a group of eight and they're traveling through the woods. We're going to look at the party size column of five to 12. And then depending on the number of creatures they encounter, if they encounter a single creature or up to three, they've got about a 35% chance of evading them. If it's four to eight, they've got a 50% chance. And if it's more nine or more, they've got a 70% chance. So there are other factors we'll talk about in a second. So what this means is that war band that's a huge amount of orcs 
they're going to have a 70% chance of just, you know, the orcs will be like, hey, we see somebody moving over there. And the party dies behind some bushes. They scatter a little bit. They The, the band looks around. No, no, that was nothing. And they move on. They've evaded. That's what that means, right? If maybe you rolled a really low uh, reaction roll, so it was very hostile, and or if the orcs are very suspicious, maybe they're moving secretly because obviously they have a reason to be there, and they don't definitely don't want to be seen. They might send out a hunting party, let's say of six. Let's say they send out two hunting parties of six. Now we're going to look at the party size of eight, so between the five and twelve, and we're going to look in the number of creatures four to eight. So again, hunting party of six. They're going to have a 50% chance, and you'll roll that twice. Each of those hunting parties is trying to find the party. There's a chance of evading each of those parties. So that's basically how that works. Nice and simple. There are some notes down here. The DM can adjust the chances for relative speed, terrain, and other factors as desired. For example, woods might add 25% chance and give a 10% chance even if surprised. Uh, if one group can move at least twice as fast as the other, the faster group can increase or increase uh, the... Uh, the evasion in their favor. So this is interesting because I find that a lot of people say the thief class is the scout in the dungeon, and then they complain that they're terrible at it. And I say a thief shouldn't be the scout in the dungeon. It should be an elf or a dwarf. And I've talked about that before, so I'm not going to go into it here because they're heavy armor. They can see in the dark. Okay, I covered it. Um, the, the thief, though, on the other hand, in light armor, moving faster than your heavily armored fighters, the they, and they don't need to see in the dark, obviously, they can be the scout because now they're faster. So first of all, they're only one. So now you're talking a party size of one. So any enemies of four plus, they have a 90% chance of evading. And if it was, if they're twice as fast as them, so let's say they're not wearing any armor and they're moving at uh, you know full speed, then they're over 100% chance of evading. I mean, there's always maybe a 5% chance you could figure that out. But even if, let's say it's a, a, a party of uh, two or three monsters, they still got a 95% chance with that bonus or a 75% chance even if they encounter one monster. So your thief can sneak ahead, see one Cyclops in the woods and still have a 75% chance of evading them, whereas the larger party would only have had a 35% chance. So this is where the thief really shines. Also, typically your thief's going to have a higher dexterity, which means that they're going to be good with like a bow. So if they do get cornered by themselves, they can let off a couple arrows and run. <laughs> so anyways, I think a thief is really useful for this. It's kind of a little side uh, thing there, but that's where I think the thief shines. A thief almost becomes a scout or a ranger, if you will. And I'm going to talk a little bit about tracking in a second, but let's cover this other part here, which is pursuit. All right, so over here we have pursuit. Pursuit, if the party fails to evade... They must fight or move away in a random direction, no mapping. This is basically the equivalent of being lost in the hex crawl. We're going to talk about that a little bit, I think, in the next video, where I'm going to build an adventure around the idea of this evasion and stuff. If the other group is faster, there's a 50% chance the party will be caught. So now we've got, uh, let's say we've got our party and the, 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 they fail to evade. They're, they're traveling through the woods in plate mail armor and they see the monsters. They try to evade, but they're unable to. So they decide we're going to run because we're outnumbered or the monster's too tough or whatever. So they run in a random direction. If the monster is fast, let's say it's a wild boar or something, you know, that's flying like a like a chimera, it's going to have a 50% chance of just catching them, right? So they're not going to be able to get away and they'll have to fight or figure something else out. If they're not caught, though, the next day, because again, we're into the next turn, they, they must now try to evade again because the creature's following them. It just hasn't caught them. And it just keeps repeating like that. So if they try to evade again and they succeed, they get away. If they try to evade again and they're unsuccessful, they can, again, run in a random direction. And if the creature is not, or well, I guess if the creature is faster, then they have that 50% chance again. Obviously, if the creature is not faster, then they don't have the 50% chance of catching them that day. You would just go the next day. And it says this may result in a party being chased for several days if the pursuers are really serious about catching them. Obviously, that's something you have to determine as the GM. If we're talking about a kingdom and they have this incursion from these adventurers, they don't want them there, they may pursue them all the ways to, let's say, the borders of the kingdom. If we're talking about the party goes into a lair of a giant and kills one giant and steals their treasure and leaves and they encounter another giant that's probably connected to the first giant, they're going to chase them to get their stuff back, right? This is the kind of thing that we, you have to determine based on the situation that happened there, and it can create a really cool narrative and story and a really fun way to do a run through the wood, hex crawl, chase, and then in the end, when they evade or end up having a fight, now they're possibly lost in the woods, and how do we get home? 
This creates really, really fun adventures. I'm going to do something here that I recommend that you do in general and that I do a bunch, which is use rules that already exist to create a new subsystem for yourself because you kind of know they already work with the system, right? So that's why. So we're going to use the evasion thing as a way to do tracking. It might be obvious as soon as I said that to some people, but let's go over it. Okay, so if we assume that the thing that's being tracked is trying to, quote, evade, we can now use the table as a tracking table. So let's say we've got our, our party. A couple of adventurers are going to go out there kind of trying to, to hunt down a wild boar that killed a uh, you know some, some villagers and they think maybe it's possessed or something. So they're, they're going to go out in the woods and try to hunt it effectively. So now we're going to look at it and say the party size, which is uh, one, right? The wild boar is being followed by the creatures, which are now the party, two to three of them. So the boar has a 70% chance of evading the party. So the party has a 30% chance of finding it. And you can just keep running through this entire thing until the party encounters the boar or it gets away. You can give it a certain amount of time until it gets away. Or perhaps they find its lair, right? Like you place the lair in. So you create a small hex map of where this, this boar might be. And then you have the party moving around the hex map looking for the boar. If, they, if the boar is unsuccessful at evading, they find it. If the boar is successful at evading, they can keep looking for it. And eventually they might also stumble upon the lair, which they can wait there for it, set a trap, whatever. And you can use this as a way to track things. This can be a great way to handle a basic skill like tracking. And if somebody put in their backstory or the player's been playing up to their character as a great hunter or something, maybe you'll give them a bonus. Again, this is stuff we can do in roleplay that doesn't need to be, in my opinion, a fixed tracking mechanic. We can just use this mechanic in reverse and effectively we have tracking. Okay, let's do a couple examples here of a party evading. They could have any particular reason why they want to evade, but let's take a couple of monsters from the random wilderness monster charts, and let's see if our party can evade them. Okay, so let's say we're in the woods and we roll humanoids and bugbears. Now, bugbears are three hit dice, right? And we might have a party of, let's say, four fourth level adventurers. You can encounter something like up to 20 bugbears. Let's take a look at that for a second. Yeah, bugbears can come in groups of up to 20. So you have 20 bugbears going against our, let's say, four or five fourth level adventurers. Now, yeah, possibly a fireball might take care of all of them. Possibly not. And if it doesn't, you might find yourself in a, in a situation, right? So the party decides that's way too many bugbears. Let's evade them and go after them later when we have a, a better mindset. It's a wandering thing. They don't have any treasure on them. It's not worth it. Let's evade them. Okay, so the bugbears are in the basic book, so I have it open next to my expert book, and we have the chart here. So bugbears are three plus one hit die, as I said. They can come in groups of up to 20. So let's say there's 20 of them, and we have five fourth-level adventurers, or maybe there's five total because they've got three adventurers and some henchmen, whatever. We've got a party of five. So if we look at the party size of five, and we look at the creatures encountered, we're at nine plus. So that gives us a 70% chance of evasion, and because we're in the woods, I might grant additional 25%. It kind of depends on if I decide if it's the bugbear's woods, like they live here, then I might not give that. But let's just say that we've given that. Now, basically, we have a 95% chance that they can just evade the bugbears by ducking under some cover, and they're good to go. Now, because they evade, they can move wherever they want. Like, they can continue to move. Let's say they're going north. They can continue north. If I decide the bugbears want to pursue, then they'll need to make another evasion check the next day. And I might say, well, the bugbears will pursue them for up to two days. So I might make them make an evasion check the next day. And then the next day, and let's say they evade each time, they're good to go. Because the bugbear's speed is only 90. And we'll assume that somebody in the party is wearing plate mail armor. That's pretty much inevitable. So the party speed is 60. So they're not double their speed. So they didn't get any kind of bonus. But now let's say instead of bugbears, there's berserkers. Okay. They're only one plus one hit die. But let's say there's 30 of them. It's a full group of berserkers. They're on a war path. They're coming. They're, they're on a raid, right? They're raiding. And who has more treasure than adventurers? So if they find those adventurers, they're going to want to take those gems and jewels and magic items. So there are 30 berserkers and the berserkers, you know, nobody's surprised here. So again, we're using the same number because the party's still five and the the number is nine plus. So it's still 70% chance. There's still a 25% bonus because they're in the woods, but the berserkers are double their speed. That will reduce the chance of evading by 25%. So they kind of cancel each other out, the woods and the speed. And now the party has a 70% chance of evading the berserkers. And let's say that they fail to evade the berserkers. The berserkers see them and they're just like, charge! The party decides we're running. So again, they run. If the party, if the creatures double their speed, right, based on the pursuit rules, 
there's a 50% chance they might catch him. So now we roll again. And if they catch him, now they're caught by these 30 berserkers. And huh, we're going to see what happens. If they don't catch him, then we're going to roll evasion again the next day, assuming the berserkers are going to follow them. And let's say the berserkers are smart. They're thinking to themselves, you know what? We're a large group. We're going to spread out. We're going to spread out into groups of five. So now we've got six groups of five following our adventuring party the next day. So we look at our party size of five. We look at four to eight as the uh, as the group size that's following them. And we see that that's 50% chance of evasion. However, the berserkers are twice as fast. So assuming they're still in the woods, that will you know cut things off. But remember, they had to run in a random direction. So maybe they ran into a planes hex where there's no penalty. Now, now there's only a 25% chance of avoiding the berserkers. Of course, they're in much smaller groups, and that's probably going to be easier for the party to take care of. So maybe it's not a big deal anymore. So what if they encounter one really large, powerful monster, and they're just like, yeah, we need to get out of here. So here we've got the Cyclops. The Cyclops is 13 hit die. So it's a powerful monster. It says they're usually solitary, although you can encounter one to four. But let's say we encounter one Cyclops. The party comes to their cave. Maybe the cave's empty. You know, that's always a good lure, right? And they take something, or maybe they're picking the, the grapes from their vineyard. So the Cyclops sees them, and they're angry, and they're going to want to pursue or attack the player characters. So we've got the same party of five adventurers, and we can see that with only one creature, they've only got a 35% chance of avoiding the Cyclops or evading the Cyclops. It... We're assuming they're in vineyards because I just said that, so that's not the wood. So maybe you'll give them a little bit of an extra chance of, of not being seen. So maybe we give them a 50% chance of evading. You know, we can play it by ear. Now, if they evade, again, they they hide underneath the some of the grapevines. The Cyclops goes by. They get the heck out of there. Or the Cyclops sees them. They don't evade. They run. They run in a random direction. The Cyclops is not twice their speed. So they have another chance to evade the next day. Since they did run in a random direction, they can't choose where, but let's say they ran into the woods. So now they're in the woods, and we've got that 35 plus 25. So now we're looking at a 60% chance to avoid the Cyclops the second day. If they evade the Cyclops, the pursuit is over. What I really like about these rules is that they're very simple, and this is like 10 minutes max of table time or less, and it can create an exciting moment where the, the heart's racing. Oh, we're going to get away from the Cyclops? Oh, we got to roll this. You know, this creates all this uh, tension and it doesn't take forever. It's not complicated. It's very basic once you figure it out. I know sometimes people look at that table and they're just like, huh? But it's pretty simple once you figure it out. It's pretty easy and it really tends to give the player characters a pretty good out. So when we take into consideration reaction rolls, distance, surprise, evasion, and pursuit. And then we look at those charts of those wandering monsters that a lot of people look at and they're just like, oh, a dragon for a low-level party, oh, a cyclops, oh, a 50 orcs, or whatever. Now it kind of comes into context. There are plenty of rules in the book that allow the players to avoid those confrontations and still have that heart pounding moment of like, oh man, there's 30 berserkers here. We might be dead if we don't do something. But really, if the dice are in their favor and they're smart and they run, they're going to be fine, hopefully. In any case, let me know what you guys think. Do you ever use these rules? I would love to hear how people use them. I've got an adventure that I'm putting together right now that I'm going to talk about next week that uses this very deeply, which is why I decided to do this video. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell so you get notifications, and I'll see you soon.